from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell and I'm in Perth this week. I flew across the Nullarbor from Adelaide to get here. Nullarbor meaning no trees because it really is desert across this massive expanse of country. But I'm now on the West Coast. And interestingly, on the plane over, I sat next to a gentleman who was a £10 pom. I've never met somebody before who took that assisted passage that was brought in, wasn't it, after the Second World War, £10 to migrate from the UK to Australia. And he sailed as a 19-year-old, I think he said he was, from Southampton to Fremantle, and he never went back to England. So a shout-out to Aussie Steve to get us underway on Stumped. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Charu Sharma for All India Radio in Bangalore. Uh, plenty of trees here, by the way. What's the opposite of Nullarbor? Well, I was just thinking, uh, Bangalore is quite an ideal halfway, weather-wise, between the cold and hot extremes of England and Australia. It's really very nice this time of the year. I don't have any wonderful story like you, Alison, but I'm just <laughs> glad I'm home. Hello, gang. It's Jim Maxwell um, here in Orange in central New South Wales on the central Tablelands, just the other side of the Blue Mountains a couple of hours away from Sydney uh, to support one of my friends with his uh, cricket team over here and uh, having a function as we go. And uh, this is a thriving regional uh, place in New South Wales, about 50,000 people. There's gold mining here. Uh, there's a university. Uh, there's a lot going on, uh, but it is a bit like the Nullarbor. It's drier than dust. And they love to have some rain. So please pray for rain for Orange. Well, there's none here in Perth, I can tell you. 40 degrees, not a cloud in the sky. But I've been to Orange, Jim, because, you know, it's the hometown of cricket journalist and good friend of, of all of ours. I think Melinda Farrell. Um, amazing drive over the Blue Mountains to get there. And and I want to know, Jim, are you going to be climbing Mount Knobolis while you're there? <laughs> that forms the backdrop to Orange. <laughs> Next well, time, I'm, look, I'll, cl I, I'll <laughs> climb the stairs up uh, to um, to my room, but I won't go as far as that. It's about fourteen hundred meters, I'm told, up to the top of Mount Conobolus, and uh, in the middle of winter, it's always got snow on it. There you go. We'll do. We'll leave Jim. <laughs> now, I left Adelaide, as I mentioned, just a couple of days ago. Uh, and as I was leaving, Pakistan's cricketers were also flying out after what was a second innings defeat in the Adelaide Test match. And it meant that the Aussies won their two match series 2-0. Two uh, the biggest talking point from that uh, second Test match was David Warner scoring 335 not out. Now, he passed the marks set by Bradman and Mark Taylor, who both top scored with 334 in their careers, but he wasn't able to pass Brian Lara's 400 or even Matt Hayden's 380 because Tim Payne declared the innings closed and called the batters in. Now, it caused quite a bit of debate uh, as to whether the captain, Payne, was right to do that. Here's what Warner himself had to say. I think we, um, we really looked at, you know, the weather that's around tomorrow. Uh, we wanted to give ourselves a lot of time. Um, you know, if we could obviously had the amount of overs that we did at them tonight and try and get a couple of wickets. <clears throat> we so managed to get, you know, six wickets down. If there is a bit of rain about tomorrow, the bowlers get a good rest. Only have to come out and then, and, you know, you have to try and get 14, 14 wickets in the last two days. So, you know, it wasn't a, a thing in our mind to, to go out there and, you know, try and get that record or anything. It was more about putting our team in the great position to actually win the test with um, weather about tomorrow and possibly the day after. Mm, he was playing a pretty straight bat there, wasn't he, Warner? All about the team. But, oh, you know, Jim, you and I were there watching live, and Char, I'm sure you were watching those runs clock up uh, from afar. I mean, Jim, the, the, you sort of felt at the time, oh, surely you could just let him stay out there a little bit longer. Well, he could have easily broken the record, and they probably still could have won the game. But uh, it's not the Australian way, as Mark Taylor showed uh, 21 years ago when he made 334 not out. Uh, it's it's about winning the game. That's the number one. In the subcontinent, other places, they love these records. <laughs> the West Indies seem to love these individual records. I've, I've got to play the middle path here because, yes, a certain part of the world or a certain country, should we say, a little more record-obsessed. 
uh, quite obviously. But, you know, there are a couple of points uh, which are probably compelling uh, to have allowed Warner to carry on. One, of course, Pakistan wasn't really going anywhere in the series. So they would probably have lost pretty quickly anyway. Secondly, Warner was scoring very quickly. And if somebody had given him a signal saying, hey, listen, you've got another one hour. Do you want to go for it? I'm sure it would not have hurt Pakistan, uh, Australia's chances of beating Pakistan. Because, you know, how often are you that close to a huge, major world record? Very, very rarely. So if they'd gone on for another hour or two and told Warner, listen, you're in 335, you've got 65 more, you have an hour, you want to do it, he could probably have done it in half an hour. So, <laughs> I, you know, you don't get to that place quickly enough. And Warner, as you said, Alison, was very modest, should we say, about it all, team, 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 team. But if the match had been close, you're running out of time, and let me quickly take you back to that uh, 194 that Sachin scored in Pakistan when Rahul Dravid declared. Oh, gosh, what a controversy that was. But in that case, there was shortage of time, and Sachin was sadly not scoring quickly enough for Rahul Dravid to give him more yeah. time to get to that double hundred. But here, Warner looked really set, and ah, imagine a 404 not out. Anyway, um, shall we bring in our first guest this week? Because this is someone who can take us inside the Aussie dressing room. Uh, it's another Australian batsman who really did enjoy putting Pakistan to the sword. Two innings and two big hundreds for Marnus Labashain, continuing an extraordinary rise that began in somewhat shocking and unprecedented circumstances back in August. Archer bowls to Smith, who's struck again on the shoulder. He's on the floor, Steve Smith. He's fallen onto the floor, helmet has come off. Joss Butler has rushed over to him. Nicely timed by Labashain as bowls. Turned away by Labashain, there's his 50. Showing a great deal of fight, his fifth half century now. He bowls to Labashain, who cranks him straight back down the ground, over the the rope. It's gone all the way. So Yashir Shah on his way and Manus whips it away through mid-wicket. He'll get there now. He touches his bat and comes back for a second. And the good times keep on rolling for Manus Labashain. Back to back hundreds. A huge wave of the bat. He takes his helmet off to acknowledge the pavilion. And if he's not an elite chest batsman, Manus Labashain, well, he's the next thing to it. What a class he's put himself in. Yep, that is Marnus Labashain. When Steve Smith was struck at Lords, he became the first concussion substitute in the 142-year history of Test cricket. He first made his debut against Sri Lanka at the start of this year, but went on to star in Australia's retention of the Ashes, and now he's cemented his position at number three in the Aussies' batting lineup with those back-to-back -back hundreds against Pakistan. And I'm delighted to say that Marnus joins us now. Marnus, welcome to Stumped. Hey guys, pleasure to be here. Yeah, great to have you on. Uh, you started 2019, ranked, what, 110 in the Test Banting rankings when we looked it up. And you're now number eight. I mean, by any standard, that is extraordinary. Are you pinching yourself a little bit? Yeah, look, um, you know, when I was listening to that clip back, it actually gave me goosebumps. I was sitting here, um, you know, just just sort of listening and obviously like rehearsing how, how it happened and... Um, yeah, you know, um, the, the way it sort of unfolded has been um, yeah, quite extraordinary. Can you take us back to that moment at Lords when Steve Smith was deemed unable to continue his innings? How did that all unfold from your perspective? Talk us through it. Look, when he got hit originally, you know, you, you sort of sit on the sideline and, and, and it goes through your mind if there's anyone a like for like in terms of a batter that bats sort of in the top to middle order and bowls leg spin. It's a pretty much the, the definition of like for like um, replacement. Um, so it goes through your mind. But then, you know, he comes back out to bat and you're like, oh, well, no, he's, he's playing. <laughs> and, you know, the next morning it, it didn't even really occur to me that it was even an option still. I thought he was just good and we're going to move on and, and Steve was going to be, you know, back to his best in no time. Um, and then obviously the next morning we had a training session, um, me, James Pattinson, Mitchell Stark, I um, mean, all the guys that weren't playing. So I was actually facing um, Mitchell Stark and James Pattinson in the nets uh, mm -hmm. and Michael Nessa. And um, Tim Payne came over for an early net and, and sort of just yelled across, mate, I think you're in. And it sort of like hit me. I was like, oh, wow. At, at that point, uh, Mitchell Stark and James Pattinson were bowling pretty quick. And I was like, right, I'm getting out of this net. Um, ASAP, because um, you know they were like they were you know sniffs, they were like rearing off a length. I was like, I ain't breaking a finger before I get a chance here. So mm. um, I got out of there and, and 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 sort of had a little bit more of a hit and then a bowl and then yeah, it sort of just unfolded and you know I didn't really feel like I was in the game because we fielded for the next two or three hours. 
um, until I actually came out to bat. And that's where it was, you know, really kicked off. And at all places, I mean, it's Lords where you have to walk out through the long room between the members. Did you even have time to feel nervous? Were you nervous? Yeah, you're probably more, I was probably more nervous before, you know, when you're watching and yet you're sort of on the edge of your seat, you're a bit nervous. But as soon as you step onto that field, all of a sudden, it's like a different level of, it's just a different part of you that takes over. It's like that, you know, that the process part just takes over. You know, you mark guard, you, you get on, you, you know, you, you know what's going through your head, you, you know, so it becomes a little bit less nerve wracking when you're actually out there because you're just playing the game. And I think that's, that was the nice part for, you know, you're nervous sort of before, but when you step onto that field, you walk through the long room and, and the members at that stage, I thought were quite, like, look, looked shocked. They're like, who is this guy? <laughs> like, because it wasn't really documented very well that I was officially in as the concussion stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, don't, I don't think, I don't know if they publicly knew at that stage that, that I was the concussion sub. So they're expecting Steve Smith and out walks uh, a lad not many of them had ever seen before. <laughs> what was it like then? You walk straight out, you face some quick bowling in the nets, but then you're facing Joffre Archer in the mood that he was in and then something happened second yeah. ball. Yeah, look, especially with the light, the light was a little bit dimming and, and you know, the crowd sits right behind the bowler's arm at Lord's. So that's something that we don't get in Australia very often. So, you know, all those things sort of factored in and then obviously he got that bouncer right on the money and it was, um, yeah, you know, it was a very quick ball. Yeah, and then all of a sudden it was, you know, it was game on, you know, when you get hit in the head, you know, your senses just all spring up and all of a sudden you're watching the ball a bit harder, you know, you call a bit louder, you back up a bit more, you know, all those things sort of happened. So, you know, it was probably a blessing in disguise really getting hit just got me going. We were talking just before you came on about David Warner's triple hundred. Were you aware of a discussion in the dressing room about, you know, whether he should be allowed to go for Lara's record you know, versus a declaration, that sort of thing? Um, no, look, there was, well, as far as I'm concerned, there wasn't even a discussion about that. It was more just team orientated the whole time. And that was the same from Davies end. It was, um, you know, it was just team orientated. It was about um, the right time to declare, the right time, um, especially with a pink ball, you know, there's a lot more advantage um, when it's... It is a little bit, you know, you get to that night session. So it was about timing that right. But also giving ourselves, um, you know, the biggest chance because, you know, in the back of our mind was we, you know, we potentially, if we were bowled really well, we were going to look to, you know, have them follow on. Well, it all turned out well in terms of the match, that's for sure. We've got Chari Sharma here from All India Radio. Marnus, he's keen to ask you a few questions as well. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Marnus. Uh, glad to have you on the show. <laughs> Moving to Australia at an early age, speaking only Afrikaans, how tough was it in a new culture, new country, language, and of course, did cricket, if you were playing that early enough, help you enormously in settling in? Yeah, look, literally the first thing we did over here when we landed um, from South Africa was uh, find a cricket club. I, I think we landed sort of whenever we landed on the week and I played cricket that next Saturday. So there was no real, um, you know, that was that was high on the priority <laughs> list. And luckily, you know, I've got such a great family. So, you know, they were yeah, that was the first thing mum and dad did. They looked for a cricket club and, and made sure I was signed on for the next Saturday. Um, but in terms of um, adapting to a new culture, you know, the Australian culture is, um, you know, probably one of the greatest to adapt to. Um, it's so open and it, it's, yeah, it, it was really, in terms of as a child, it was it was quite, it was easy to sort of adapt into the culture. But in terms of the the, the English and stuff, yeah, that took, that took its time, especially the in-classroom sort of learning. But, you know, I think, yeah, from that early, that early age, I was able to still communicate a little bit, especially sort of with like in the playground and, and sort of out of classroom um, was still all right. Well, you're doing all the right things. I think talking to Steve, keep talking to him, yeah. keep soaking it all up. Everyone who's ever worked with <laughs> you and coached you just says you're an absolute sponge and can't get enough of talking about the game. So keep up the good work. Good luck for the rest of the Aussie season. And thanks so much for sparing a bit of time to join us on Stumped. Thank you, guys. It was a pleasure. From the BBC World Service, this is Stumped on All India Radio. OK, well, let's address a couple of other talking points from the week in cricket. Um, Charu, India are building a cricket stadium that's going to be bigger than the MCG. Tell us more. Oh, gosh. I mean, what with these big stadiums? I'm not too fond of them at all. And, of course, in India, we are suffering in terms of test cricket, at least, where we can't fill up a 30,000 stadium. So I don't know what the ambition here is. One, of course, could be this whole world record thing. I think we mentioned it earlier in the program about numbers being very important. This one, of course, is a 110,000-seater, mm. which is incredible 
which is certainly colossal. But I do wish that the facilities in general in stadiums in India would improve a lot more rather than the seating. Uh, by the way, the cost of this, as you may know, is about a seven. Or is it a hundred million dollars? So that's a lot of money in our in our part of the world. And you know, not that much cricket is held in these large stadiums. Just a few matches every once in a while. Yeah. And when there are lesser matches, as it were, the domestic tournaments and otherwise, then all you need, all you hear, is this echo ring around an empty stadium. So I just, I'm not so sure. Bragging rights, yes, maybe, but um, a little unfounded for me. It's just. There is this race to, to be, you know, biggest or, or, or best or what. I, I, I wish there was a race for being the best, if not the biggest. But, yeah, I, I, I don't know what fuels this, but it will certainly look very grand. And I do hope to get the facilities 100% right for the spectators who are usually left uh, uh, wanting a bit. What about the size, though, Jim? I mean, bigger than the MCG. How's that going to go down in Melbourne? <laughs> They've never heard of India in Melbourne because they're only interested in Aussie rules football. So you're going to play no, Aussie rules football? I, how often, <laughs> seriously, would they fill this stadium? That's, that, 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 it's, as you say, it sounds like ego gone mad. What's the big match going to be to inaugurate the stadium? Is it an IPL yeah, game? Yeah, well, there's talk in March about the inauguration. And, uh, I, you know, I like the concept of of continental teams because for long uh, uh, there's been a so there's been so much speculation about what if there were an India Park combined team taking on the rest of the world well Pakistan mm. is not exactly covering self and glory right now but i believe the plan is to have an asia 11 taken take on the world 11 and uh, yeah that mm. could be quite a landmark match and, and and probably pretty close too i just wonder if the stadium will fill but that could be an interesting start and, and it's not clear whether it's going to be a long form or i, I suspect a, a one day international well that's all from this week stumped on all india radio don't forget to contact us throughout the week on twitter you can tweet at bbc ws sports using the hashtag bbc stumped my thanks to Cherry sharma and jim maxwell and to you for listening see you next week bye bye Stumped is a BBC sport production for the BBC World Service in association with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and All India Radio.